guarding it are angels who are rough or strong. They will never disobey Allah in anything and they will always follow what they are ordered with. That is simple order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save yourself and your family. What does it mean to save yourself and your family from the fire of hell? When somebody says you save yourself from fire, what does that mean? I'm asking a question here. What does that mean? Yeah, but yeah, but before that, you see, the brother is saying by obeying what Allah asks you to do, you you do what Allah asks you to do and abandon or avoid what Allah prohibited from you. Yeah, but why would you do that? No, no, no. Why would you do that? There is something in between saving yourself from hellfire and doing what? Yeah. So exactly that is your, that is the link in there. So you are going to do what saves you from hellfire. When I tell you save yourself from hellfire, what am I asking you? Do everything that saves you from hellfire, whether it is doing it or not doing it. So there are things that if you do, it will save you from hellfire. And there are things that if you do not do, it will save you from hellfire. So I'm asking you for that first. And that's the definition of taqwa. That's the definition of what? Taqwa. On the other side, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَوَاتُ الْأَرْضِ Haste, compete, rush towards the maghfira of Allah and Jannah. Is maghfira يعني, uh, an area called maghfira? If there's an area called maghfira, you're going to go to it? No. That means you are going to do everything that will get you the maghfira of Allah. So there are things that you're going to do for the maghfira of Allah to come at you. And once you get the maghfira, Jannah. So when I say, let's go to the Jannah, that means let's do everything that will get us to Jannah or avoid everything that will get us to Jannah. You need to stay away from hellfire, save you from hellfire means do everything that saves you from hellfire and abandon everything that also saves you from hellfire. Is that clear so far? Hmm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to save ourselves and our families. So it's not only about you, you also have a responsibility toward what? Your family. Fil Jannah aydan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ أَلْحَقْنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَمَا أَلَتْنَاهُمْ مِنْ عَمَلِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said those who believe and for those who believe, الذين آمنوا this is the category of believers وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ their ذُرِّيَّ their offspring Allah did not say how many generations your ذُرِّيَّ is your ذُرِّيَّ you are the Zuriya of someone. Maybe you have a pious, righteous, eighth grandfather. Allahu A'lam. And because of him and his dua, you are praying now in the masjid. Yeah? You don't know. And maybe your dua, Ya Allah, bless my children. Allah give the best blessing for ten generations to come. You don't know. You don't know. They say, في سورة الكهف. سورة الكهف. When Musa alayhi salam and the Khadr went and built the wall, you know, there was a wall about to collapse and they built it. And then said the Muslims didn't like it and all of that, but at the end he was interpreting it for him. He tell him, وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا Their father was a pious righteous person. They say it was their sixth grandfather, not their direct father. In the interpretation, يعني, they were saying it is not direct father for many reasons, يعني. For many reasons. Because if father built it before he dies, it's fresh. It will not go down. Yeah. Right? And if father did it, people would have discovered the thing. Why he's building a wall? You know? Why is he doing that? So the idea is it was for someone salih, salih, yani pious, righteous, not necessarily the direct father. So because of your righteousness, you can be actually saving. Huh? The progeny, yeah, long 
all of his brain. So don't look only to your own children. That's why I tell people, raise your children to be able to raise children who raise other good children. So when you are raising your children, you are not raising them for themselves. And that's a mushkil. We are in a very, very selfish culture, culture of the world, yeah. selfish culture, individual culture, you know, self-centered culture, not caring about your own family, let alone the society, subhanAllah. Everybody wants to leave the family. Everybody wants to leave their parents. Everybody wants to, everyone like that. And the culture, the material uh, aspect of it is magnifying that. Any child now you get, they can't wait until they are on their own. Yes? They don't think that how this family can protect me and make me bigger and make me, and my khair is gonna come back to my family like their khair come to me. Nobody thinks like that. But that is why we need to work on the family after Ramadan from that perspective. Hmm? Everything you do in jama'ah, you wanna take it back to the family. That is your first jama'ah. Not the jama'ah of the masjid here. The jama'ah of the masjid is the second jama'ah. That's the larger jama'ah. But your first jama'ah, that you fight for it, that you have to nurture it, that you have to preserve it, that you have to live for it, is that group around you who raised you and you've grown. You go out and start your own, but you never forget that first one. Huh. Uh, Allah said, those who believe, and their offspring followed them with their faith, we will make them accompany them and join them in Jannah. Meaning what? The father went to Jannah in a higher degree. And the son or daughter or grandson or daughter or that went to a lower degree. Allah will upgrade you. How many times you saw that somebody is upgraded because of someone in business class? Doesn't happen. <laughs> oh, because your father in business class, we're going to give you another business class. What well, doesn't happen? Even you cannot go visit them in business class. Can you? If they want, they come to economy for you. But in Jannah, it's not only visit, you are upgraded. You know, in the score of SAT score, they said they take the highest score and count it for you. In Jannah, it's like that. Family member is high, the rest of the family join. So Allah told us to save ourselves and our families from hellfire. And Allah told us we will be joined in Jannah as families, even our a'mal is not the same, our deal, deeds are not the same. So I just told you the main two things that you are asking. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana fil akhirati hasana wa qina. Ya Allah, we want to enter Jannah and be saved from hellfire. Faman zuhziha an al-nar wa udkhila al-jannata faqad fa. The one who is saved from hellfire and admitted to Jannah is, and both of them, Allah mentioned you and family. That is the part I wanted to emphasize on. See, see, this is your goal, right? Your goal is to enter Jannah, correct? Allah said, you and your family in Jannah. Whom azwajuhum, them and their families, their, their spouses. Udkhuluha bisalam in ameen, enter. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in many verses, their azwaj and their zurriya, when they enter Jannah, they say salam, the angels say salam to them. So the main thing that you want is to be saved from hellfire and admitted to Jannah. And Allah said, save yourself and family. You are admitted with your family in Jannah. Is that clear so far? So now. Hopefully, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah. Yeah, but Allah Azza wa Jalla said, yeah, this came in the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about the Hafiz of the Quran that Allah will give his parents a higher degree because of the Hifz of the son of the Quran. So Allah gave them Tajul Karama, the crown of dignity, Wahulla min Noor, and a, a garment of light that the sun light does not come anything compared to it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them high degree in Jannah. Yeah, rahma of Allah is wasa'. Fa Jannah and the hellfire, Allah Azza wa mentioned about family in Jannah. Tayyib. 
Also, we live in this dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended for us to come as a result of a family. Yani Allah did not create Adam and give him ability to reproduce on his own. Some species like that. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make Adam and Hawa like animal kingdom, for example. Animal kingdom, they deliver the child. And the child have, to, I mean, the calf or the chick or the baby or whatever it is. And they have to stand on their feet in a few seconds. Yes? So the care of the parents is very limited. The care of the parents is very limited. In all mammals like this, except human beings. Human being is the longest child, childhood on the planet. You see the hikmah in that? There is a hikmah in that. Allah Azza could have made us like other animals, right? You were born, and after a few hours, you stand on your feet. And you have to fetch for your own food after a while. Why Allah Azza wa make it like that? So you appreciate the family. See? The mom has to suffer and struggle, not only in pregnancy, continuously. And the father had to go out and all of that. They have to give you the care and all of this. Because Allah intends you to stay in that unit, not to abandon it. The intention is not to abandon it. In animals, the intention is to abandon it. Intention is, once in your own, you are on your own. This is not a mom or dad anymore. You know that, in the animal kingdom, right? The cat grows up, it's not mom, it's not dad anymore. Khalaf. Done. Dog is the same thing. Does not have that kind of issue. It yani will come always to the mom and will come to the dad. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. They can actually fight against each other after a while. Yeah. But human being, no. Allah put that in there. So you grow up and you find these two figures in front of you. The dad and the mom. And then Allah made them test for you. Either they become reason for Jannah or hellfire. Whatever you do, you cannot pay them back. So you keep doing. That's the idea. <laughs> yani whatever you do while you are with them, you cannot pay them back. So you leave them. Actually, if you stay with them and you do, you will never pay them back. So you don't leave them. You're leaving them is out of the picture. Even if you physically leave, you are not emotionally leaving them. You are not spiritually leaving them. You are not mentally leaving them. Is that clear so far? That's a family. Parents. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you grandparents also. When you go, you find grandparents. And then you grow a little bit, then Allah gives you spouse. And you have siblings. You see how the family is growing now? So you are a child, you only see two people. When you grow up a little bit, you find maybe your grandparents there. That's four people. Then maybe you look on your side, you find one or two siblings. <laughs> huh? And then you grow a little a bit more, another person come from another family, become your spouse. Either they take you, if they are female, or you bring them in. <laughs> so they take your daughter from you, go plant her in another family, to make it to help another family. Or they bring her to your family, your son bring her to your family. She's planted now in your family. And then you grow a little bit more, then you have children. Then you grow a little bit more and you, have, you are a grandfather. And that's how Islam wants us to see it. That's how Allah intended it to be. Once you start looking at yourself, you're lost. You're alone now. And the Nabi Sallallahu said, the wolf takes the stray sheep. وقال, الشيطان ذئب الإنسان. Shaitan is the wolf of the human being, like the actual wolf for the sheep. يعني the sheep, the wolf will eat what? The stray sheep. And the shaitan will deviate who? The stray human. Now how you cannot be stray? Family, Habibi. Your friends are not there for you all the time. Your friends, there is a limit of friendship. That they stay with you or agree with you, it's a limit. But parents, they give their life for you. 
and they will continue doing that until they depart. Nothing. Nobody on this, the face of this earth wants you to be, be better than them than your parents. See, who else? Your own brother, your own sister does not want you to be better than them. This is a fact. But your dad and your mom, they for sure want you to be better than them, even if they are not saying it, even if they are not showing it. It's in the heart. If they are not, they are sick. There is some problem with their head. The father and the mother, they want their child to be what? Better than everyone and better than them. And in their eye, even if they are 100% sure that their child is not good, they don't want to say it. And they don't want anybody to say it. Have you seen any love more than that before? So stick with the family. Now, worship in Islam, there are parts that you do alone, and there are parts that you do with people. Parts you do alone, and parts you do with people. The part that you do alone, sometimes only you have to do it alone, like fasting, for example. Fasting. But salah, you do it with people. Right? And there are things that you have to do with each other. You have to learn Quran with somebody, but you recite Quran on your own. But there are parts that you do on your own, and parts you, you do together. And there are parts you do alone or together. And there are parts that you do part of it alone and part of it together. So Allah make it like that. So now who will be the first unit that you practice that with? Family. Where do you learn the salah? How did Rasulullah said the salah? He said to the parents, teach your children salah. So where do you learn the most important thing? From your family. You see, sometimes you are very, very, very fortunate that you are in a Muslim family. You are born in a Muslim family. Alhamdulillah. Very fortunate that you are born in a Muslim family, that you find that they are praying, that they are doing dhikr, that they are knowing that it's halal and haram, even if they are not practicing, but at least they are Muslim. So your family has a favor upon you. And those are like your training, your resident training camp. <laughs> family, you consider it what? Resident training camp. Family. You know, I don't know whether you did it or not, but when I was young, every time I'm going to give a presentation, I give it in front of my mom and my siblings. <laughs> you try in them first, right? And you go and, and they, you know, clap for you or you say, oh, mashallah, like that. You see? I want you to look at that every time you succeed. Even when you grow, you become a boss or a CEO or something like that. I want you to know that you owe this to your family. Just, just have this mental exercise, you know. There is part of your success, for sure, direct or indirect, you owe it to your mom and your dad. You owe it to your brothers and sisters. Maybe you're not feeling it, but they are part of who you are. This here is a result of a man who is my father and a woman who is my mother, and the siblings and the cousins and the good and the bad and the enemies and the friends. I'm a result of this. This character is a result of everything and everyone around me. This character here, this human being that you are dealing with, whatever I do, whatever I say is a result of what? 40, 50, 60, 70 years of these people around. So I owe it to them. I owe it to them. Sometimes you feel that why Allah made the shaitan shaitan, you know? Because his existence helped you to become better. We can go in that direction and in philosophy, but everything counts in this world. Everything counts. Every encounter that you go through counts. So when we say our family, not only after Ramadan, but I'm giving you the concept of the family bigger than just Ramadan and all of that. Then we talk about the plan, right? In education or the people of, you know, uh, behavior, behavior, they say minimum of 25 days, you do something consistently until it becomes a habit. Some say 40, some say, but minimum of 25 days. And they say also minimum of 25 years to make an impact on a, on a generation. If you want an impact on a whole generation, that's 25 years. So whatever you want to see after 25 years, you start now. 
Is that clear? And this is, by the way, what they did after World War I, World War II. You know, all of these things, they wanted to change a nation. They, the media starts, the plan starts, and then the media starts carrying it in, and then it goes to the education, it goes to the health, it goes to everything, until you find people who were born, and they are now 25 years thinking the same way. And those who are 25 years, now they are 50, they are thinking the same way. They have the same fears, they have the same hopes, right? Everybody wants this kind of business, everybody wants to retire that way, everybody wants to do the job that way. It takes time. And now it becomes automatic after that. You don't have to do anything because the next generation is going to become even worse or better. Yeah? That's why Rasulullah raised the Sahaba in a certain way, spend that much. You see? Spend that much. Like, you know, uh, uh, 13 days, uh, 13 years in Mecca and 10 years in Medina and two years with Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq. So 25 years exactly. And at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, they conquered the world. You see what I'm saying? So that's why somebody says, why in Mecca they were struggling like that? It's just part of the plan. They have to be the product of that. And then they have to have 10 years of complete education after they were built, after they were like, you know, like they went through it all. Now they carry the deen seriously. See now? And that's what I'm saying. Like, if you start with your child, by the time they're 25 years old, they're a leader. It is not like someone who's going to cry once, you know, their credit card is declined. <laughs> or something like that. No, they know exactly how to lead. It's not crying when they're hungry. Because, you know, oh, I cannot order. Oh my God, a car ran out of gas, Baba. <laughs> Come on, man, you are 20. <laughs> Fayani, you do that, it takes 25 years for a generational impact. And that's what Ahmed Masjid Salam here, we're trying to come up with a plan, a team, with all of that. So a generation comes and this becomes like a default in their life. They go to a masjid that is well organized, that has programs, right? So it's kind of like, this is the default. This is the way a masjid should be. So wherever they go, this is their point of reference and we built it and our uh, uh, you know uh, uh, youth will carry it so in, in, in a generation time everybody look at this as the model I hope this idea is important and that's what you do at home with your family now oh. yes Yes, I agree. There are, the, 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 for people to, 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 to become a scholar in Al-Azhar also, they used to condition to start studying that you memorize the whole Quran. It doesn't matter. That's why seven-year-old kids will join and 17-year-old kids will join. They'll go first grade memorizing the Quran. They cannot go first grade. So that's why first grade, you will not find a child in the first grade. They have something called Kutab or Maqra'a or Mahdara or, you know, Quran class like Mulana Faruqi has here. They will learn everything. They will learn uh, grammar. They will learn how to read, how to write and everything. They don't need to go to school. That was a school and all the people, they were literate like that. So you know how to read and write and you read and you know your Salah and everything informally. In that kind of every corner, there is one for the subdivision, right? A teacher, a sheikh, teach that. And we went, you know, I, ca I caught this kind of tradition at the end, you know, like before you go to school or anything, when you are three or four, they send you to learn the Qaeda and the Quran and everything. But if you want to join the regular education, you join when you're five, right? But if you want to join Al-Azhar, you have to memorize the whole Quran. That's before elementary school starts. In the beginning, right? Like a hundred years ago. Yeah. And memorize the whole Quran, then they start teaching you after First grade, they start teaching you uh, like hadith and uh, tafsir and all of that. And you have six years of elementary, four years, they used to be four years of middle school, five years of high school, four years of college level, and then at least five more years until you get like a, what, equal to a PhD. To be called a'alim, right? 
So exactly, I, I understand what he's saying. And that is because they knew the, 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 the importance of knowledge. It's not a shahada, it's not a certificate. Now everybody care about the certificate. I want the certificate to hang it on the wall. Before it's not a certificate. There was no certificate. It was enough that you have the biggest ulama in the country testing you and they tell you you are, yes, you can teach now. That was the certificate. <laughs> that was the achievement of, of lifetime. But 25 days, if you wanted to pray Fajr in Jama'ah, and you come, you wake up your family and pray Fajr every single morning for 25 days, it becomes a habit. So that's one segment here. If you say every night we're going to have dinner together at this time, but you continuously fight until 25 days, then everybody's going to miss it. If you don't, Witr, Sunnah of Fajr, Sunnah of Maghrib, eh? praying at the masjid, 25 days. And when you break one day, restart. <laughs> Reset. That's the fun of it. Reset. I'm, I'm telling you, you will not lose. You're winning. Even if it takes you a year. But at the end of the day, you're winning. You're winning something big. It will stay with you for the rest of your life. Someone was saying about Saeed ibn al-Musayyib. Saeed ibn al-Musayyib. A great name. And he's a student of Abu Huraira. Sayyid ibn Musayyib is one of the great tabi'een, the biggest scholar in Medina of the tabi'een. Sayyid ibn Musayyib, great. His father was a Sahabi of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Musayyib ibn Hazm. They saying Sayyid ibn Musayyib did not miss takbirah of ihram in jama'ah at the masjid for 50 years. One single. He's not saying, we are not saying he missed the salah. لا. He did not miss the takbir. يعني he was there on the line when the Imam says 50 years, five, five times a day. توفيق من الله. As this is not a human effort only. It's not a human effort only. So if you practice something with your family until it becomes a habit, it stays with you. Because Allah knows your intention. Allah knows your intention, سبحانه وتعالى. We prayed Taraweeh in Ramadan. And we prayed together. So let's do something similar at our home. Something similar at our home. If you miss a jama'ah at the masjid, try to make it in jama'ah at home. Don't pray alone. When you come from work, Assalamu alaikum ya awlad. Wa alaikum salam dad. Wa alaikum salam husband. Wa alaikum salam wife. Wa alaikum salam mom. You guys pray zuhur. No, let's have wudu and pray together. Try that. Don't pray alone. Because I see that a lot. I see that a lot. Father come pray by himself. Mother pray. And nobody's asking about the other person whether they prayed or not. So that's another one after Ramadan to maintain the family is to care about each other and each other's ibadah. Can we do that inshallah? So ask. Did you pray today? And say it in a nice way. Don't say, pray? Why didn't you pray? No, no, no. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. Ask in a nice way, in a caring way, in a loving way. I love for you what I love for myself. You know? Alhamdulillah, I pray. I'm waiting. Yeah, I'm waiting for you. Oh, but I'm, I'm going to do the wudu. Yes, I'll wait for you. Do wudu and we'll pray together. Husband and wife, right? Pray. The word together is important. So do the salah together. Create a habit and do the salah together if you miss it at the masjid. Now, can you do jama'a salah other than fard? Yes. You can do salat al-layl, tahajjud. You can do tahajjud together in jama'a. Or do before you even sleep, you can do. But you cannot pray in jama'a, the nafl, uh, the, I mean the sunnah of zuhur, the sunnah of maghrib. La, this is sunnah ratib, by yourself. But nafl extra, extra, yani, Non-conditional, yes. And what is the dalil for that? The dalil that Rasulullah 
was praying at night one time, and Abdullah ibn Abbas narrating a hadith. He said, I went to the, uh, the Maymuna. Maymuna is his maternal aunt, and she was the wife of Rasulullah. So he went to the night of his aunt, يعني, and he found the Rasul وسلم, did wudu and started the salah. And Abdullah ibn Abbas was a child. He did not reach puberty. يعني. Okay, so he came, he said, I joined Rasul وسلم, from his left side. Left side. So the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam held him from his ear like this, brought him back here, and he took his ear like this, and brought him to his right. <laughs> took him, <laughs> he told him, he stand here, yeah, while he's in the salah. And then Abdullah ibn Abbas said, and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started reading Al-Baqarah. And he said, I, I said, he's 100 verses or something. He started reading Surah Al-Nisa, Surah Al-Amran. <laughs> <laughs> While Abdullah ibn Abbas, child, standing beside him. And then he made the ruku'ah. And then, you know, the ruku'ah was closer to his qiyam. وَالرَّكْعَةَ the whole night, يعني. And then he stood up. His standing was close to the ruku'ah. And then he makes sajda like this. <coughs> طبعا, this happened with Abu Dharr also. And another sahabi. It happened with another sahabi. But I'm telling you, how you raise, raise children. So you can pray nafliya with your family for training them and all that. Yes. If you're telling your own wife to do the right salah, uh -huh. you think that that salah has to be done by her taking the salah? Very good question. An 11 year old. <coughs> Come on, leading the salah has conditions. One of the conditions is al-aql, tamiz. And you know tamiz, in Urdu they say tamiz. But tamiz, tamiz. Tamiz, and you have good tamiz. Tamiz means understanding, distinguishing between things. So there are three categories. Seven and below, I mean, for, uh, below seven, that's one category. Above seven is another category, from seven to puberty, and then from puberty and above. Is that clear, right? So we divide male, because Salah has to have malehood. Yani it has to be a male, not a female, to lead the salah of males, right? For females, is a different issue. For leading with each other, yani that's a different issue. But for someone to lead the jama'ah of males or mix, it has to be a male. It's the kura, yani. Tayyip. Some of the scholars said baloog is a condition. Yani puberty is a condition to lead the salah. Okay? And the majority say tamiz. Meaning, if he is below seven, does not lead salah regardless. He knows or he doesn't know. There are smart kids who are five years old and pray salah better than others. But still cannot lead. Is that clear? So under seven, regardless how good they are, they don't lead the salah. And some of them said they don't make adhan either or iqama. Right? Right. What if they are seven? We look now. Do they know the rulings of salah or not? You cannot make them lead unless they know the ruling of salah. Ruling of salah means they do not look around, they read Surah Al-Fatiha, they know how ruku' is, they know sujood is, if they forget what they do, they, they have to know these things. You do not just push them to lead people where they don't know what happens if, if they you break their wudu, what happens? What happens if their wudu is broken? You do not just let them lead like that. But tamiz, yani when they are seven until puberty, you have to look to that very well. When they are a puberty, they have to know the ahkam also. You cannot put a you know, majnoon to lead the salah even if they are 50 years old, you know. It's not gonna count. Uh, there has to be aql, and they don't have a mental defect. They have to have tamiz, right? And they have to be a male to lead the salah. So if they are 11, they can lead without repeating the salah or anything like that. If they already know how the salah should be led and everything, yeah, we can train them. They can lead the salah and all of that. Better when you are in the masjid, not to allow the children who are below puberty and who do not know to lead the salah. You do not train them with a regular jama'ah. You train them on the side. You do not train them in a regular jama'ah because this is like people who have knowledge, people who know, people want they come to the masjid for a certain quality of salah. You do not just push a child to lead the salah for them without knowing. Yes, we want to train our children everything, but not that way.
they can learn with a smaller jama'ah, with children at home, you train them until they become very good, and then yes, they can leave uh, the salah. So even if we have a hafiz of Quran or someone, but they are under seven, they don't lead. If they are above seven, if they know how to lead the salah and everything, they should leave the salah. No problem. And there is a hadith in Sahih Bukhari for that. Hadith Mahmud ibn Salima, radiallahu anhu. He said that, you know, I was very young. I was very young. And when he was very young, he, he did not see Rasulullah sallallahu with full capacity to understand. Yani. He said, yani, the only thing I remember from Rasulullah sallallahu that one time when he was making wudu, I came and sat beside him and he spit some water on my face. Rasul was playing with him and he did like this with the water on his face. He, he blew some water on his face. He said, يعني, مجتن, مجتن From Rasul Sallallahu he was like playing with him يعني, when he was doing wudu. He said, this is the only thing I remember about the Nabi But he was a child, baby. يعني. But when يعني, he grew up and he was like seven years old, he said that I was the one who memorized most of the Quran in my family, in my jama'ah, يعني, in his tribe, outskirts of Medina, he was the one who. So they make him lead the salah. They make him lead the salah. So his shirt was very short, and he was not wearing underwear or anything like that. The underwear was not known, يعني. so he has a long, uh, they, have, they have long izar, like when you are in hajj. You don't wear underwear, right? And if, you are, if it is short and you are not careful, when you make sajda, what's going to happen? So his behind used to show. <laughs> when he makes a jud. So the women complained from the back. يعني. So they said, Kufu anna ista imamiku. Ista al-imam bitaaku zahir. يعني. <laughs> يعني cover your imams behind. <laughs> the women telling the men, cover your imams behind. He's narrating this hadith in Sahih Bukhari. يعني. He said, فَجَاءُ لِي بِقَطِيفَةٍ فَمَا فَرِحْتُ بِشَيْءٍ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ فَرِحِي بِهَا <laughs> So they bought him a very nice, you know, sod, they say sod, the, the very nice velvet kind of uh, fabric. He said that it's very long and I was wearing it. He said I was the happiest person in the world <laughs> with that to lead the salah. So from that hadith, Imam Bukhari, يعني, uh, uh, you know, construed or deduced from it that Imamat al-Sabi, tajuzu Imamat al-Sabi, the imama or the leadership of the salah for the child can be there and they, they use that hadith because he was seven years old يعني, and he, uh, he did that. So you don't have to repeat the salah if the child knows and he's above seven. Hmm. Also, <coughs> Ramadan showed us, alhamdulillah, that we can observe fasting easily. Yes, because of obligation you fasted, but you could do it. You could do it, you fasted. And guess what, subhanAllah, for the next 30 years, Ramadan is gonna come in the winter. Less than 30 years, maybe for the next 10 years or 15 years. It takes 33 years to make a full round, by the way. 33 years to come on the same day. Like if you started uh, Ramadan in July, it will take you 33 years to, until you fast in July again. So half of those would be like kind of cool weather, yeah. So we have 10 to 15 years coming, inshallah, Ramadan will come. So you don't have a problem with fasting. What I'm trying to say is we can fast Monday and Thursday, which is good. <coughs> Especially we, we, uh, we, we succeeded to come to the masjid and break the fast together. Hmm? Why you don't do that at home? Ma ahlik. Monday, Thursday, three days a month. Some kind of, you know, tradition to start with the family after Ramadan. To remind us of the Ramadan and to get ready for the next Ramadan. That also can be something very good. Recitation of the Quran. MashaAllah, many of us insisted on praying every night behind the Sheikh until he finishes. Yeah? They prayed 20 rak'ah, they wanted to hear, hear the whole Quran. Right. You heard the whole Quran in 30 days. Why you don't hear it at least once in one year? Or recite it? Okay. And you succeeded in managing to do it in 30 days. Make it times 10. Yeah, 10 times easier. Finished in 10 months. Okay. You can finish in 3 months, but you finished in 10 months. Listen to it. Yani say, I'm going to listen to the Quran on the you know, uh, tape or the CD, whatever. Yani Quran podcast or Quran video or something like that. I finished the whole khatma, then I started again. 
Subhanallah, my maternal grandmother, may Allah have mercy on her soul, uh, after my grandfather passed away, when she was still young, I mean, uh, every time, I, as far as I remember, every time I go visit her, she has Idaat Quran Kareem. You know, the, there is a channel, I mean, station, you know, AM station in Egypt, it's called for Quran only. So Quran is 24-7, plus some religious programs here and there. She memorized the Quran through that one. Because they used to finish the Quran every six days. Is that the Quran Kareem until now, until our time? Every six days, the Quran finishes audio over the 24 hours. When Sheikh Abdul Basit, for example, come and he starts Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Tartil, Tilawa, right? And then other programs come here and there, here and there, here and there, right? So you have about seven, eight hours every day with recitation of the Quran. So in six days, Sheikh Abdul Basit finished, then Sheikh Minchawi comes, then Sheikh, you know, like, you have about 10 sheikhs, they go like this. So she, the Quran, the, the radio, her radio beside her on the bed is on that channel 24 7, all the time, and she has it in a low voice. Right? So I said, she memorized the whole Quran like that. And it goes like this. That is what I'm talking about as a habit. It becomes part of you. She's sitting. And when we are sitting in a conversation, she speaks very little. She wants us to leave, yani. <laughs> I'm telling you that's her way of, yani, why are you here? Uh, you are good, alhamdulillah, yalla, go to your mom. Because she, she has something more important. Yeah, that's her life. Her life became this. Now, if one of us, while she's in the middle of the conversation, went and turned the radio on, oh, why the radio is off? But we're, we're talking. But khalas, it's become part of her life. Her ear is used to life like this. You understand the point? I'm just giving you some example, maybe strange or maybe like extreme, but it happens. If Quran becomes in your, your life, you can't wait until you hear the portion. So make it like that. Now, alhamdulillah, we have control. It is not يعني, against your will, يعني, it is going in the radio. Now you can control. You turn it on when you're commuting. Listen to the whole Quran from the Sheikh and say, I'm going to listen in one week. I listen. Or I listen in 10 days. Or I listen in a month. Shmushkin. No problem. Listen to one juice every day. Listening, listening only. And then repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. Quran becomes familiar. You heard every word of the Quran, ya akhi, and you keep hearing it. And the shorter the round is, huh, the more present Quran in your head. Any had you ayah, you want to finish it with them. Anybody recite an ayah, you want to finish it with them. Why? Because your ear is used to it. I'm magnifying what we did in Ramadan. Because if we do it only in Ramadan, you have 11 months to forget. Trust me. But if you do something for 11 months, comes Ramadan, you enjoy it. Because you've been hearing this. You heard this khatma for at least 11 times. You know this Quran you hear in the Taraweeh? You already heard it 11 times, if it is in a month. You heard it 50 plus times, I mean 40 plus times, if you hear it every week. So can you imagine now how much you are present with the Sheikh? Even if you don't know Arabic, that's not the issue now. I heard this before. This ayah sounds familiar. <laughs> now the following Ramadan, you're going to read the tafsir of it. You're going to read the meaning of it. Five, six, ten years. MashaAllah, now you are somewhere else. And that is best to be done with the family. Because there's someone to ask you and communicate with you, and you do that together. It's very important with the family to sit always and mention positive things. Start this habit, inshallah, and you'll enjoy it. You sit on the dinner table, for example, if you sit once a week or twice a week or every night, every night is even better, sit on the dinner table and sit everyone mention something positive that happened to you today. You know what's going to happen? Everybody's going to mm, positive, positive, because we are full of negatives. <laughs> Until you find it. Then the next thing, everybody before dinner want to be ready with a positive thing. Then what is the next thing? You start doing lots of positive things. You understand the game? <laughs> so the game is, you say that we wanted to mention only positive stuff. 
Don't tell me what you suffered from. Mention positive things. Now you want to look for positive. So now you want to be ready when you sit on the table that you did not do positive. What are you doing with your life, man? <laughs> then after that, you start doing lots of positive to pick from. And now we see the best positive. And we become positive, inshallah. So can we do that, inshallah, with our families? So we sit together and start saying that. Mention one positive thing that you talked about, that you did today. Or it was done in front of you. Or somebody said to you, it doesn't matter. Mention something hello, yeah. mention something good. Oh, today I prayed Salat al-Fajr in Jama'ah. Great, alhamdulillah. Pass, pass the next one. You know, today I cooked a very nice dish. Oh, today I enjoyed, I uh, did this in the school. Today my teacher gave me an A or a B or whatever it is. So mention something positive. Today I helped someone. Today someone was bullying and I helped like something like that. Then you, your mind will be driving you to do positive things. Because you want to be positive now. You are on the right track. Also, it is important to have a plan. Like I sit with Brother Reza here every Sunday, almost every Sunday, I mean, 90% of the time, <laughs> every Sunday morning for one hour to discuss about the masjid plan, what we did last week, evaluate it, what we're going to do next week, and what is our plan for the next month. And we keep doing that all the year round. The results are amazing. Even when you do not do something, you know that you need to do something in your head. And then you self-evaluate and you correct your course and all that. And I started thinking, why don't do that at home? See? And that's what a believer is. You benefit from what you do at work to take it to your home. You benefit from what you do at home to take it to work. Positive, positive, positive. Produ productive. Become productive. Alhamdulillah. You become productive. So you do that at home with your spouse and then involve your elder children with you. We're planning. What are, what's, what's our plan? What did you do last week? The positive is a session, right? For dinner. But sometimes we sit together and say, okay, let's talk about, like, you know, our uh, tasks that we did last week. Alhamdulillah, we did this, and I did this, and we did this, and that, that. And, you know, this we, we did not do. Why we did not do it? Let's focus on doing it. Do you need help? You know, that kind of thing. And next week, inshallah, we're going to visit this and we're going to go outside and we're going to eat at this place. We're going to go to the park and we will take the children and we do that. We plan. And for this month, our theme is such and such and such and such. And do it at home. Believe me, next Ramadan will come while we are better people, better families. Yeah. Right. Right. We have a theme of the month at the masjid here. The question here or the comment is like in Islamic school, they have a theme of a week or theme of the month. The kids become attached to it. The parents work with it. The teachers work with it, right? So we, we have something to go around. That's actually the whole idea. Allah Azza wa said, وَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَتَفَرَّقُوا يعني Imagine there is a rope that we all have to be holding to. This is the theme of our life. The theme of our life. So then you have a theme of the month. It is not like we abandon the whole deen except some, something. No, we are not doing that. We are focusing on one thing. Focusing on it. We are focusing on it. When we say the salah is the theme of this month, it doesn't mean that we don't pray other months. That we give more focus. You're going to ask me questions about salah only. You want to focus. Yeah. So it is more focused on salah. Next month is more focused on the zakah. Next month is more focused on the zikr. That's, so it is very good, of course, to have the theme of the month or the theme of the week with the family as well. It, <coughs> right. Right, I like that. So you hold, like in Ramadan, we're talking about the heart and the sickness of the heart and all of that. So it is something that you hold to and you look forward to. Everybody's coming and looking forward to what the Sheikh is going to say about hearts today. See? So mind... Get distracted easy. So you always bring it into focus. That's why we do prayer five times a day. It's not only one time and we are distracted the rest of the, of the day. Hikmah min Allah Azza wa Jal and ja'ala salat al khams fi awqat al Not one night. Not one time. Why? Because we get distracted fast by everything. So something has to bring you back. It's your compass to bring you back. 
bring you back. And you get distracted with money, so one thing has to bring you back once a year. It's a cat. Once a year for a month, siyam. So you train yourself and all of that. Once a lifetime, the hajj. To live with the ummah. To see yourself with the ummah. You, you know? So Allah give us the maintenance. And then siyana, yani. The daman, the siyana. Yani we have that maintenance. With tawkeel, uh, maintenance. Maintenance, daily maintenance, uh, weekly maintenance, monthly maintenance, annual maintenance, lifetime maintenance. Mawjood. It is there, alhamdulillah, rabbi alayhi. So lots of activities to do with the family. We don't want the family to be where we always shout at each other. We're always pointing fingers at each other. La. Yeah, we can criticize each other, uh, constructive criticism. But why this would be accepted, how this would be accepted when you do other good stuff too. يعني كما تحاسب أولادك كافئهم يعني لي why we always focus on you know holding kids accountable for things that they did not do. We always have the punishment ready and the, all of that. But we don't have a system for, of reward. مين كم واحد عنده system of reward? It's either a spoiling system. <laughs> I call it spoiling system. You spoil the kids or you make them miserable. يعني there is nothing in the middle. Yani those who think that they are good to their, oh, I'm not barbaric with my kids. I am, you know, not uh, hitting them. I'm not doing anything. Okay, great. So what are you doing as alternative? Giving them everything they want. That's worse. This is abuse and this is also abuse. You know why it's abuse? Because you are destroying their future. You are destroying their character. They are not going to be uh, reliable people. They're not going to be reliable people. They are not going to be independent. They are always going to be enslaved. Because you give them everything easy. So there has to be a middle ground. Before you, you, you hold the kids accountable for what they didn't, you first commend them and reward them for what they did. And the reward does not have to be out of the world. Yani. It can be a very simple thing. It can be a hug, it can be a smile, it can be good, can be thank you, there is a reward. At my house, masjid is a reward. You know, come to the masjid, you are rewarded. To come to the masjid with, with dad, you know? To dress in a certain way is a reward. To get your favorite uh, toy or you do, is a reward. But they know on the other side, if they miss or they do something, they're gonna lose a privilege. Not necessarily a punishment, but you can lose a privilege. Sometimes, losing a privilege is more scary for kids than physical corporal punishment, you know? Losing a privilege. You're gonna lose phone privilege, you're gonna lose this privilege. No, 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 it's okay, I'll do it. But if you hate someone or you put punishment, now they tasted it. It's not scary anymore. See what I'm saying? It's not scary anymore. Once you go physical, you're lost. You lost already the battle. You lost the battle. Because they develop tolerance, they will become depressed or they will become rebellious or they will hate you. Lots of problems, you know? For the family, we have to have a reward system and an accountability system. Hand in hand. Hand in hand. One more thing. Uh, we have to develop this competition at home. Inshallah, Brother David here, we do competition of Quran in the masjid every year, right? Why you don't have one small mini competition at your family level? Say, for example, we are going to have a competition of memorizing 10 hadith, 10 hadith. Huh? Have a competition of memorizing 10 surahs of Juz Amma wa Sajweed. And we give a deadline, yeah? And we are going to make this here. And when we, whoever win, we'll make a special dinner or we'll give you some gift and put the prize. Even you can put a chart in there and put the name of the father and the mother and the children, you know, and let them compete with each other. This is something that they look forward to. Don't you think? Make this kind of competition. Create something. Feel alive. Make the family feel there is some goal more than just uh, eating and sleeping and going to work and coming back. Be goal. There is a goal. There is a goal. 
Have you achieved something? Oh, there's a hadith. Oh, this hadith is, oh, I don't understand. Let me go ask Sheikh Mabruh about it. And you come back, oh, I asked the Sheikh and he told me such and such. Fikida communication, a lie. And mashallah, now if you are uh, older and you have children and grandchildren, you can make the competition a little bit bigger. Huh? Involve another family with you. Your own family. And the grandfather have five, six families around in the competition. Whoever going to win, I'm going to pay for your dinner. You know, grandpa is going to take us for dinner. <laughs> yeah, competition. Sometimes, subhanAllah, when the kids are young, they love the competition for the sake of the competition. They are not looking for the reward like we do. Sometimes the parents are the problem in competition. Right, Brother Zabin? Wallah. Sometimes the parents are the problem. Why my son did not win? And the son doesn't care. They are hugging each other. You know, the kids are already, the kids are already happy, congratulating. Oh, good job, you know. I know, I was there when I was young and the kids, my kids are there in the competition. They don't care. They are happy for each other. Parents have the problem in their heart. Oh, the judge was not good. Oh, they were not fair. Oh, the... Yaqi, subhanallah. Let it go, man. Let it just... Kids, you know, let them have fun. Ya khwani, the summary. Summary. You have a bigger jama'ah and you have yourself. But you have a smaller jama'ah in the middle. That is your family, your parents, your grandparents, your children, your siblings, right? This is your jama'ah. Lots of nafli you can practice together. You can check with each other. You can have a weekly meeting, uh, night, every night meeting to focus on the positive. You have to have a system of positive and, uh, you know, rewards and accountability. You're always there to compete with each other in goodness. And this is how we maintain a good family after the month of Ramadan. So all the good things we learned as a community in Ramadan, practice it with your family. Uh, breaking the fast together, caring about each other, praying together, reading Quran together. We do that with our own small family, inshallah. So when next Ramadan comes, we are way better than the last Ramadan. May Allah Azza wa Jalla reward all of us of what we said and what we heard. Wa sallallahu wa wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Anybody have a question? Yes. Very good question. Do we have to, can we listen to the Quran while we are working or doing something? Or uh, it is better to listen 100%. Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْصِتُوا لَعَلَكُمْ تُرْحَمُوا يعني When the Quran is recited, listen to it and listen attentively. استمع يعني you hear the voice, you hear the words. But أنصت means you are, you are, pondering upon it. You're understanding what this is the surah, or this is the story of Sayyidina Musa. You are ansat now. Yani ansata, yani sami'a bi fahmin. Yani he's listening with understanding, not only listening to the sound. Now, we are not going to say it is haram to listen to the Quran while you are working. No. If you are working, and the Quran is not making you like distracted from your job, because sometimes you focus with the Quran, you are not giving the job it's right. Like sometimes you are doing analysis or you are doing something. Now one of them will be distracting you from the other. That's when you are not supposed to, right? So be basically focus on your work because you need to focus on the Quran as well. But if the Quran, you are listening while you are doing some, you know, motor task or doing something, that's fine. Yani you don't have to be understanding and uh, knowing the tafsir of every thing, single word, it's better than listening to a song, yeah, right? It's better than doing that. Uh, there is difference. Do, do we listen, listen to the Quran before you go to bed or you go to sleep? I don't see is it a problem either. Sometimes when you listen to the Quran, it relaxes you and you sleep. It's, it's good. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Even you read the ruqya on someone who cannot sleep until they sleep, you know? So we read the ruqya sometimes. We read some Quran for a person. When somebody is sick or somebody is dying, you read Quran for them. Right? They are not going to be uh, listening for the tafsir of it. They are just listening to the sound of the Quran. It's soothing. It's shifa. Yeah. So it is okay as long as you are not doing for treating Quran yeah, with disrespect or you are not listening to it or people making voices or people talking and chatting and the Quran in the background. That's not right. Right? That's, that's, not, that's not good. Yeah. So either you listen or you, you know, uh, you turn it off and listen to it whenever you have time. That's much better, inshallah. 
Anybody else? So Quran is a, has secrets on it. And some secrets do not open to you until you dig for them. Remember my words, right? Sometimes Quran will not give you everything unless you dig for it. You run for it. You have to want it. You have to love it. You have to want it. Then it will start giving you. But if it is a duty or it's a task, you're going to get something, but not everything. Now. Very good. When, when you buy a new house, the practice of reciting Surah Al-Baqarah or playing Surah Al-Baqarah يعني in that house over and over, it's good. It's actually a sunnah because the Nabi, not because we burst the house. It's not, it's not that. But in any house, the Nabi وسلم, said يعني Surah Al-Baqarah, أَخْذُهَا بَرَكَةً وَتَرْكُهَا حَسْرَةً وَلَا تَسْتَطِيعُهَا الْإِهِ السَّحَرَةً يعني Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, taking it is a barakah. Is barakah, is a blessing, wherever it goes. Because it has the whole deen in it. Surah Al-Baqarah basically has the whole deen in it. The six pillars of faith, the five pillars of Islam, lots of akhlaq, everything in Surah Al-Baqarah. Stories, everything in Surah Al-Baqarah. So when you take it, you're taking the whole barakah of the, of the deen. And abandoning it is regret. A person regret in the akhirah that they abandoned Surah Al-Baqarah. And uh, it saves you from sihr, jadu, yani magic. It saves a person from magic. So the house, that Surah Al-Baqarah is recited in it, it has rizq, it has bar bar barakah in it, and uh, there is no harm that comes to it from all this evil and evil doers. So when you uh, make it a habit for Surah Al-Baqarah to be played or recited at your home, it's good. But reciting it is better, of course. But if you don't recite it, at least play it, يعني. somebody else recite it, it's okay. And uh, when you have a new house, of course, you want it to start that habit, but it's not because a new house you are doing, يعني, because it's your house now, and you want to start the sunnah in it, it's not only one time and then, لا, يعني at least once a week, try to have Surah Al-Baqarah recited at your home. Now, if somebody hafiz and they're reviewing the Quran all the time, of course, it's going to be recited all the time in there. May Allah Azza wa Jalla give us the barakah of Surah Al-Baqarah and the barakah of the whole Quran. Inshallah, we listen to the Adhan and remember Salah, Inshallah, 9.30, right? Brother Zabina.